Uh, I am a teacher. Um, I preach, teach. That's how I uh, conduct my ministry. And uh, that's what I'm going to do this, morning, this evening. And uh, <clears throat> Christian asked me to talk about the family. And uh, I'm good at talking about the family. I have five kids and 20 grandchildren. And uh, all my children are serving the Lord. Uh, I have four sons who are all in the ministry. And my daughter is, and her husband are very involved in our church as leaders. And um, all my grandchildren are serving the Lord. And um, so I have a little understanding about God's order for family. And um, years ago, okay, whatever you got to do, you got to do. <laughs> when I was young, I was introduced to a concept that I'm going to share with you tonight. And it has directed my life, my whole life. And this, this concept I had was that the Holy Spirit said, I will guide you into all truth. He didn't say partial truth. He said that he will guide us into all truth. Now, that doesn't mean we will have all the truth. But what we do have, we can know is true. We can be absolutely convinced it's true. And when I was young, I began looking at the scripture from the viewpoint of God's order. The scripture is the final authority for all matters of faith and conduct. All matters of faith and conduct. It's never outdated because it addresses human nature and human nature is the same no matter where you're living. I've been involved in missionary endeavors and quite frankly, I don't care whether it's Guatemala, Honduras, Philippines, Botswana, anywhere I've been, Israel, people are all the same. They have the same fallen nature and they act the same way. And so the scripture never goes out of date. And when I was in Bible school as a young person, I, was, I graduated at high school at 17, and my granddaughter beat me. She graduated at 15, and she got a year of college in before she was 16. And uh, when I was young, I was introduced as a 17-year-old boy at this, with this thought. The scripture teaches something called, repeatedly it teaches this, the ways of God the ways of God. And, you know, so often in this culture, we're looking for some quick fix. If we've got marriage problems, we want a quick fix. If we have problems with our children, we want a quick fix. The problem is, that's not going to be a solution for troubled homes and troubled lives. <clears throat> a little Band-Aid, when you need major surgery, is not going to solve your problems merely rearranging a few faulty concepts that you have. And so often our faulty concepts were given to us by the church. I was raised as a Christian. I accepted Jesus Christ at four years old. I was all by myself in my bedroom. And um, I had just turned four at the latest. I lived in this house till I was four months, four years and three months. So sometime before four years and three months, this event took place. And I was alone in my bedroom, and I lived in a Jewish neighborhood. I happened to have Jewish blood. My brother's an Israeli citizen, but I, we didn't know that at the time. And we, but we just, my dad rented this house in this Jewish neighborhood in an upscale Detroit neighborhood. And, and we weren't upscale people. We were, you ever see the movie Beverly Hillbillies? That's what we were. We were right straight from this farm where we didn't even own a bathroom. And we went right into this fancy apartment in a Jewish neighborhood in an upscale area of Detroit. But anyway, I was sitting in my bedroom and I, we, my family served the Lord. They all went to, we all went to church together. And I was sitting there and I thought to myself, I'm going to say something bad. I'm just going to say something bad. 
You know what the problem was? I didn't know anything bad. I lived in a Jewish neighborhood where they didn't use bad words. I lived in a Christian home where they didn't use bad words. I, I went to church and all my family associates were Christians. I didn't know any bad words. I wanted to say a bad word. Finally, I sat in my bed and I thought and I thought. And I said, I know what I'm going to say. So I got up off my bed and I went out to the doorway and I looked down the hall to make sure no one was near that would hear me. I didn't want to get a spanking. I went back to my bed and I said, Jesus is a bum. Now that's pretty bad. That's blasphemy. <laughs> Thankfully, you can blaspheme the Jesus is not the Holy Ghost. And I instantly came under conviction, rolled over on my knees, and I repented for being such a bad boy. And I served the Lord the rest of my life, all through grade, high, grade school, high school, college. But when I got into college, I had some really wonderful teachers, godly men, men who had national ministry, some of which are still alive. They're 87 years old, and I just was with one of them in um, North Carolina in the fall. And he's, he's nationally known, internationally known minister. And he introduced us to two things that arrested my life for the rest of my life. And they are the kingdom of God and the ways of God. Did you know God has ways? He does, sing, he does things a certain way. And when it comes to family life, it, it's rather critical that we find out what his ways are. And when I was young, we got, I, was, I met my wife at 17. I have her picture here in my wallet. I show people what she looked like when she was 17. And she was a, she was a beauty. People say, how did you get her? <laughs> I said, I was pretty studly myself. <laughs> Anyway, we met at 17 and married at 19. We were married 46 years when she went home to be with the Lord in October of 2015. And uh, I made a choice as the head of the house that I was going to study the scripture from the viewpoint of what is God's ways for the family. You wouldn't believe the opposition I got from pastor, pastors and pastors' wives and, and people. Christians, I'm convinced that, I said this to our congregation this morning, the Christian community has more to fear from the Christian community who downplays the message of the gospel than they do the wicked. Recently, Joel Olstein, how many of you have heard of Joel Olstein? He's called the pastor of the United States. He was being interviewed, and Ravi, how many of you have heard of Ravi Zacharias? Yeah, okay. He's one of the great, great, great Bible expositors in the United States right now. He's, you, if you want us to get some really wonderful teaching, get on YouTube and look up Ravi Zacharias. He's one of the few men that I recommend openly because he is so dead on in almost everything I've heard him say. Ravi Zacharias was talking about Joel Olstein, and he said, Joel Olstein made a statement to him in a meeting that Islam and, the, and, the, and Christianity weren't that far apart. And so Ravi said this, not far apart. They don't believe Jesus is the son of God. They don't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. They don't believe Jesus died on the cross for our sins. They don't believe Jesus was resurrected. They don't believe Jesus was the son of God. And they don't believe that he's coming back as the king of kings and lord of lords to rule the earth. He said, so just how close are we? Joel Osteen's a heretic. He, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're being pretty blunt. No, he's a heretic. Anybody who says that Islam and Christianity are really close together is deluded and deceived. And they do not know God's ways or God's word. What has happened is the authority of scripture, which is the final authority for all matters of faith and conduct, 
has been set aside for feelings. Feelings. How many of you have ever heard so many people say, well, how does that make you feel? You know, the truth makes me feel bad a lot of times. Because when the Lord tells me the truth, sometimes it's like, mm, I don't want to do that. But it's the truth and I better. Now, one of the things that is extremely important is the scripture says we are to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I have lived my life with one goal, finding out God's opinion about everything in my life. Finding out God's opinion. For an example, I'm not going to get into this because it's not part of what I want to share, but discipline. All sorts of Christians won't spank their children with a paddle. They call it abuse. It's funny, that's what the Bible says to do. If you didn't spank your children, you know what the Bible says if we don't spank our children? We hate them. That's what the Bible says. If a man doesn't discipline his child with the rod, he hates his child. Let that soak in. That's what the Bible says. And I looked up all the scriptures of discipline with the rod all through the Bible. My mother-in-law used to say, you beat your kids. I didn't beat them. I spanked them with a paddle. And I have a two-hour class on how to give a spanking properly. Literally, it takes two hours for me to teach how to give a spanking properly. And I use scripture. And um, one day my father-in-law was talking to me, and, and, and he had a, another daughter just very close to the age of my wife. And she married a minister, and he didn't believe in discipline. He said to me one day, nobody's going to teach me, nobody's going to tell me how to raise my kids. And he was defying the scripture about discipline. Well, at that point, I never spoke to him again about the topic. And he's raised two kids that are not who I would be proud to call my son and daughter. And um, one day, my father-in-law was with me, and we both got a dog from the same poodles, same mother and dad poodles. We both got a dog. So they had a poodle dog from the same mother and father we had, and I had a poodle dog. One day, he was at my house. And he looked at me, and he was a minister. He was pastor of our church before I was for 23 years. He said, there's as much difference between your dogs as there are your kids. Their dog was this snappy, yappy, disobedient, rebellious little poodle that I'd like to kick across the room like a soccer ball. He just was an ugly little dog. And my dog loved everybody. And he said, you know, there's as much difference between your dogs as there are your kids. Those kids are now in their 40s. And my kids are all in their 40s but one. And the difference between their kids and my kids is so dramatic. But they didn't do it God's way. Nobody was going to tell him, including God and the scripture, how to raise his children. We have to throw down imaginations knowledge and thoughts that are in conflict with the ways of God. Amen. You have to say to yourself, I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what Dr. Spock's, uh, Dr. Spock, was that who it was? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Spock. How many of you have heard of Dr. Spock? He wrote a book on, on how to raise children back in the 50s. When he was 85, you know what he said? I renounce my book because I have destroyed a whole generation. And if you're wondering why we've got the problems we've got now in our culture, you can trace it back to Dr. Spock and his book. And he knew he bred rebellion at the end of his life. And now we've got young people trying to tell us how our constitution should be worded. By the way, I just listened to a video of Doc, uh, Netan, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he made a statement. He said, if Israel didn't have guns, and, and by the way, every Israelite home has to have a gun, an M16, everyone. 
And he said, and if we didn't have guns, we would have ceased to exist a long time ago. And he said, only a, a country that has arms is free. When you were living, how many of you were born and raised in Romania? Did you have guns? Would you like to have had some? <laughs> Would you have been able to use them to maybe take, was it Ceausescu? Maybe take him out a little bit earlier? He's, you know what, uh, you know what, uh, how many of you have ever heard of Yasser Arafat? One of the most vile men that ever lived. His bodyguard said that Ceausescu was so vile, and he was, he was Arafat's bodyguard, he said that when I shake Ceausescu's hand, I feel I need to go take a shower. He's so filthy, spiritually speaking. And this guy was Yasser Arafat's bodyguard. You can't get a whole much worse than Yasser Arafat. Anyway, there's all these things that are being pushed by young people thinking they know better than the founding fathers of our country. And they're a bunch of stupid 17-year-olds. That's just plain idiocy. And we're acting like, oh, we should listen. Well, if we do, we will lose our freedoms. Because if you have eyes to see, the socialist Democrats are trying to overthrow the freedoms of the United States of America. But I know those things because I know the Bible. I've learned God's ways. <clears throat> when we learn God's ways, one of the things that we need to recognize is that we are responsible to change the way we live. He said the word of God is like a mirror and we look into it and we see ourselves. We're not to go away and forget what we saw. We're to go and do what it says to do. Let me say to you all that the world and the ungodly and carnal Christians will never understand your standards if you obey God. When I was a teenager, there was a I was 17, and there was a lady in our church who was considered very spiritual. And I was talking, and I was in Bible school, and I was talking to some of the students, and I was learning that there's a deeper life in God, more than just getting saved. You know, the Bible talks about to them that receive him, and to them he gives power to become sons of God. The word sons there is a Greek word for children. But the Bible speaks about sons throughout the Bible, and it says all creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's another Greek word, and it means mature sons. Jesus did not come to just save you and take you to heaven. Jesus came to change you and to change you into his nature, into his character, and Jesus has saved you to bring him to himself so that the glory of his presence can alter your destiny eternally. He wants to change you into his image. One of the problems that we have, the Bible says that the wisdom of the Lord is foolishness to the ungodly. That's 1 Corinthians 2. And um, Jesus said that the wicked were men that justified themselves before men. And that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. One of the things I learned years ago was this. A man's, now listen to this statement. This is a critical statement. You should memorize this and use it and quote it and embrace it. A man's morality will dictate his theology. Let me say that again. A man's morality will dictate his theology. And that's what's happening in the church today. Men who want to be immoral, men who want to be carnal, men who want to be sensual, women who want to be sensual, they are literally, they don't care about God's ways. They don't care about God's opinion. They just want what they want, regardless if it's in conflict with the word of God. And their morality is dictating their theological positions. That's not how we're supposed to live. The Bible is the final authority for all matters of faith and conduct, and we are to find out what it says and then adjust our lives to what it says by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm going to draw a couple diagrams tonight. <clears throat> the Bible says that, that we are to present our bodies by the mercies of God as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect to will of God. Our minds have to be renewed. And the only way that's going to happen is if you bathe yourself in Scripture. And I'm not talking about just the New Testament. The idea that the Old Testament has nothing to do with the New Testament church is a lie from hell. Jesus and the apostles didn't have a New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament. And if you understand the Old Testament, instead of listening to Tim LaHaye and Hal Lindsey and, and people who talk about the dispensations and the stupidness that they're teaching, you will find that the Bible's message from Genesis 1-1 through the last verse in Revelation is the same identical message. There are no dispensations. There's just a message of the kingdom. Now, If this is a wall, and this is another wall, and let's just put numbers like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If anything between these two walls is acceptable before God. <clears throat> and they are biblical norms. There's different levels. And if you go too far in biblical, past the wall, you come into cults. You come into legalism. You understand? You can go beyond. Oh, thank you. You can go beyond the boundaries of Scripture. How many have understood? The church has wrestled with dress codes for centuries. Are you wrestling with that here? How many of you know? That Bible, the Bible says that God told all the Israelites, men and women, to gird their garments on the Feast of Passover when they were in Egypt because they were going to have to walk a long way. Do you know what girding the garment means? Does anybody want to volunteer what it means to gird your garment? Huh? To pull it up, fasten it under your belt. Or they could reach down and pull this leg up this way and reach down and pull this leg up this way and then you look like you had pantaloons on of some kind. You know, you've seen pictures of the or Middle East with that kind of dress. I did an experiment. Told all the ladies in our church to go home and get their robes, their, their bathrobes. And the bathrobes were to be all the way down to their ankles, almost touching the floor. And then I wanted them to pull them up and put them under the belt of their, their, their bathrobe. And then I wanted them to measure the distance between the bottom of the robe and the top of their knee. <laughs> you know why I did that? Because God told the children of Israel to, to gird their garments. And if God told them to do that, Whatever was exposed in his mind is acceptable. Now I'm seeing some real pursed eyebrows. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Go home and do it, ladies. Every single woman in the church had a bathrobe that was from three to four inches or less above their knee. You know what the problem was? I said, that's the standard of God whether you're sitting or standing. And if you wear a dress that's that short when you're standing, 
when you sit down, it's going to go up about six inches and be unacceptable. Isn't that simple? When I was a boy, the dress code was the middle of the calf. When my dad was a boy, it was the ankle. And anybody who didn't wear dresses down to their ankles were hussies. They were loose women. And then when we were long, young as a loose woman, if it's the middle of the calf, and then it was raised up to the bottom of the knee, and then it was raised above the knee, and then it was mini skirts in the church. And I said, Lord, you have to have an opinion about this. You're the one that wrote the word, and you don't want women exposing their bodies in such a way that men are inspired to lust. What's your standard? And one day he just said, I told them to gird their garments, and whatever that is, that's my standard. <clears throat> well, we'll move on from here. Here you have monastic, you know, um, monastic. uh oh monasticism you know priests priest moving into these houses living but if you go the other way you can go past and you have humanism you know what humanism is humans decide what's right and wrong that's the garden of eden and you end up having Atheism. And you end up having immorality. How many of you know that right now, whole denominations are openly saying that homosexuality is acceptable? In California, right now, before their Congress and their Senate, is a bill to outlaw the sale of any book in California that speaks disparagingly of homosexual activity. Do you know what the fruit of that's going to be? They won't be able to sell Bibles in California. That's what's going to happen. Of course, California's idiots. It'd be nice if that fault line would just pssst, put them into the sea. You say, oh, that's terrible. I don't think it is. How many of you know that one time God said, you know what? The world is so wicked, psh, flood them out. And he killed every human being except eight. We have this idea that people are just so important. Let me tell you something. I'm teaching in our church right now the book of Revelation. This is an absolute biblical declaration. In the next few years, one third of the earth is going to die. And of course, there are people saying, oh, we're going to be out of here when that happens. Well, dream along with me. That's not biblical theology. You are not going to get raptured out of it. And anybody who believes that has not studied their Bible very closely. They've just accepted what they were taught without studying it. When I was 15... I was studying the Bible and realized that theology was false. And I have a whole course on the second coming re-examined, and I go through every major point of the theology of Tim LaHaye and Hal Lindsey and so forth, and I show how every one of them falls apart in Scripture. If you think you're going to be raptured before all this happens, here, let me... Let me you know, I... <laughs> I feel like I'm a full, a full vessel, and I just have all these different ways that I can go. Let me shock you with a question. I would like anybody in this congregation to come to me after service. Well, I'm not going to be here. I threw up. Literally, when I was getting into my car, I had to go in and throw up, and I'm going home as soon as I'm done preaching because I'm weak, and I'm tired, and I'm not feeling well. But you can get online and send me an email. I challenge anyone in this room to give me two verses anywhere in the Bible that proves there even is a seven-year tribulation. Two, just two. How many of you know that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything has to be established? 
So if you can't produce two verses to prove a seven-year tribulation, you don't have a theological position that's biblical. And you know what the problem is? There aren't two. <laughs> I can prove that's so simple it's unbelievable. But we, we've got these ideas, and, and we've been given these humanistic concepts, and God has already killed the whole world, thousands, tens of thousands, probably millions of people in one flood. And then he's going to bring judgment in the last days in the book of Revelation, and a third of the earth is killed in one judgment and another 25% in another. When you put those together, half the world is going to die soon. And we're building our lives around foolish pursuits, education and homes and money and security and retirements. It's not going to work. It's going to fall apart soon. Read the book of Isaiah chapter 17, and when you're going to find out, Damascus, it says, is going to cease to exist. Israel is going to nuke it. They're going to take Damascus out very soon. Anyway, we have all these humanistic, atheistic, immorality, crazy ideas. Here, here's one. How many of you know there's a population explosion? Come on, raise your hand. Don't sit there like bumps on the log. If you think there's a population explosion, raise your hand. You don't think so? Do you know how big of a piece of property it would take for the whole world to stand in one spot right now? The state of Rhode Island. And they'd all have five square feet. If every living being, human being on the earth was to stand in Texas, they would have 1,100 square feet each. Just in Texas. There isn't a population explosion. But the humanists had to sell that idea if they were going to get abortion passed. We've got to get rid of people. Do you know how many abortions there have been in the world since abortion started? How many have a figure? Anybody know? Do you know how many abortions were in the United States in the last, since the 73? Who knows? Huh? I don't know what you just said. In the United States, it's 58 million. All right? In the world, it's 1.4 billion babies have been murdered. And you know why they could do it? Because the humanists told the church and everybody else, there's a population explosion. We got to get rid of people. And so the church quit having babies. And the population died in the church. When I was having children, I said, I don't care what they say. That's a lie. And I'm going to have as many kids as I want. So we had five. Actually, we had six. We lost one in a miscarriage. And then my kids have all had children, and I got 20 grandchildren. So out of these loins have come 25 kids. Just think if every single Christian in the United States had raised 25 children, and now I have grandchildren who are voting. How the socialist Democrats and those who hate freedom would have no chance of ever electing Hillary Clinton. She wouldn't have even been considered. But we know what we do. We say, oh, the world's got all these ideas. We've got to be careful. The biblical norm is in between these two. Now, here's our problem. Now, all of you listen close. Let's say that this number here, 10, is really walking in the full counsel of God. They're really finding out what the Bible says. They're doing what the Bible says. They're finding God's ways. And this here is just inside the door. They just got saved. They don't know much of anything. A little bit dumb. But a person, a person living here 
often thinks they're actually living here. Just talk to a, a fighting fundy. You know what a fighting fundy is? A fundamentalist Baptist who thinks they've got the corner on truth. Hmm? They think they, they you know, I have Baptist friends, but the Baptist folks, you know, I, I had one Baptist preacher in the area, a large church, said some young girl, she went to our church and was adopted by a family in our church, should go to hell. What a silly statement. And that girl's going to hell anyway now. They think they're living way up here. They don't even know what it means to walk in the Spirit. But if you're living here and you think you're here, when you look at this guy, it puts him way out here. Do you understand what I just said? The distance between here and here, he's still in the kingdom. But if this guy thinks he's here, and he looks at this guy, and he sees this distance, that puts this guy here, way out here, in cults. And it's easier to call something a cult than it is to address the biblical things that it presents and answer the biblical questions. And it's, it works the same way over here. Many people who are really running after God even though they may be up here at 9 or 10, they're humble people, so they don't think they are. Do you understand that? Please don't think I'm being arrogant when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, but this is just the facts. Recently, I've been listening to a lot of national-level teachers because I like to expose my doctrines and my concepts to others than just me and those that are around me. And all of a sudden, I went to this meeting in, in uh, North Carolina in November, and this 87-year-old statesman of the church, recognized as one of the most important Pentecostal leaders in the last 60 years, was teaching in a little group of 20 people that he invited me to be part of. And as he was teaching, I'm sitting there saying, I mean, people in the room were going, ooh, wow, hmm, wow, ooh, that's rich, that's deep. And I'm saying, I've taught that. I've taught that. I know that. I know that. And I shared a few scriptures with him, and he went, wow, that's phenomenal. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I realized he wasn't teaching anything I didn't already know. But I would have never likened myself to him up here. I'd have thought I was way down here. And you know what happens? If I am up here somewhere, but I think I'm here, when I look at the guy here, I think he's over here. He's out of the church, he's not even saved. Are you following this? This is a deep theological thing. Now, <clears throat> let me give you a concept of a conviction. Convictions are interesting things. If I were to ask all of you, do you base your opinions on biblical convictions. How many of you would say yes? Well, years ago, the Supreme Court had a problem. There was a bunch of these renegades calling their, ch their homes churches, getting mail order... No ordination papers and using their homes as a church and taking them off the tax rolls. Well, the government said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got to decide what a, what a, a religion is. So they came up with three things. First of all, they came up with it has to be based on a conviction. And here's the three things about convictions. A belief 
that doesn't change. I can't say that a dress at the calf is wicked. And then 10 years later when culture changes, a dress at the bottom of the knee is okay. Changed. Convictions don't change. That's why I told you to get your bathrobes out. The second thing about a conviction is that it's a belief that is seen in the daily life. For an example, you can't say, I disagree with my school teaching my kids evolution. The first question I would ask, why do you have your kids in a school teaching evolution? Why are you letting your kids walk in the council of the ungodly every day and expecting a church service and a few little short prayer meetings in your house to undo everything they're feeding them for eight hours? I don't believe it's biblically Christian, Christian acceptability to be in a public school. If you're sending your children to public school, you are disobeying God because he said, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And every day you send your kids to a Christian school or a, a, a humanistic public school, you are committing them to the counsel of the ungodly for six and seven hours a day. And if you don't like it, you're wrong. When I moved here from northern New York to take the church I, I pastored, I moved from a church that was running about 175 to a church that had 25 retirees with one foot on a banana peel and the other one in the grave. And almost no income. The total income of Calvary Christian Church in 1983 was $38,000. That would hardly pay the heat bill and the light bill and the phone bill. I took the church. And I didn't have it, they didn't have enough money to give me a salary. So I decided, oh, I'm going to put my kids in a, Christian, in a public school right down the street here until I can decide what to do. I went in, enrolled them, and I met the principal. You know what his name was? Mr. Levin. And the Lord said, you send your kids to that school and they will be leavened with humanism. Get them out. They never went more than one day. I told my wife, I'll get a job, and I have the capacity to do construction and so forth. I said, I'll get a job, but my kids are not going to a public school. If you would rather put your kids in a public school so you can pay off a big house, you are deluded and deceived. Are you listening to me? You might never want me back. That's the truth, because you're sending your children to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And money is more important than your children's character. A belief is seen in the daily life and is consistent with our other beliefs. I don't believe in ev evolution, but my favorite magazine is National Geographic. I won't ask you how many of you have National Geographic, but you know what? That's one of the most humanistic, evolutionary magazines on the face of the earth. I won't send my kids to a school where they teach them humanism, but Time Magazine and Life Magazine are in my home, and I let them look at TV programs that is feeding all the wrong things. See, that's not seen in the daily life, and it's inconsistent. Here's the problem. Our convictions must be correct. They must be correct. And if they're correct, you know what? They're worth dying for. I made up my mind that when God showed me the truth about something and I saw it in the word, I would die before I would change my mind because the scripture was plain. The thief comes but to kill, to steal, and destroy, but he comes to give us life. God wants us to have truth in the inward parts. What time am I supposed to be done? Just keep going? I can go all night. <laughs> Let's say these mark the years of your children's life. I 
I don't know how many I've got here, but I hope I have around 18. Start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. My writing isn't really great. Fifteen and sixteen. Let's call this seventeen and this eighteen. Okay? That's your children's lives. When they're 18, you finally send them on their journey. Now, when a child is one, they're idiots. Star. I had a friend whose little girl walked, walked, literally crawled off a 15-foot high porch and fell onto a cement pad below. And the only thing that saved her was prayer, and she was fine. And I know her today. She's normal. I had a nephew who took a glass of bleach and drank it. He was so idiotic, he didn't even know he was drinking something he shouldn't be drinking. So when a child is one, you have to truly protect them from themselves, and you have to have boundaries that are very, very rigid. You understand that? But as children begin to grow, you begin, as they get a little older, you can begin to release the parental restrictions. We'll call these parental restrictions. Both of these. When I was 12 years old, my brother and I went out to Howell, Michigan, and camped for a week by ourselves. When I was 14, we went up north with our high-powered rifles and hunted deer by ourselves with 30-odd sixes. That was when I was here. Do you know why that could happen? Because a child who is young, he has no boundaries at all. But if you're faithful as a parent, what you're going to do is teach that child in such a way that he begins to restrict his own freedoms. Self-imposed freedom. Now, you don't give a four-year-old a 30-odd six. But my folks bought me a 12-gauge shotgun for Christmas on my 12th, birth or 12th Christmas. And we would go hunting deer and pheasants. Because back then, kids were mature. Today, they're a bunch of kids. I don't want to say what. <laughs> they're immature. They're just plain immature. I was married at 19. I was pastoring at 27 with four kids. As a parent is faithful with their parental restrictions that are reasonable, based upon reasonable convictions, not stubborn convictions, not something you learned in Romania. It isn't right because it was from Romania. It isn't right because it was from Nicaragua. It isn't right because it was from the Methodist Church. It isn't right because it was from the Nazarene Church, which I was raised in. And you know what I have found? A major portion of the things I was taught in the Nazarene church proved to be false because I studied the scripture and learned that's not true. You know what they taught us? Speaking in tongues is a demon. That's what they taught. Give you an idea? Maybe how to change some opinions? But parental restrictions need to be based on Reasonable convictions based upon the authority of God's word 
And when you tell your kids, listen, kids, this isn't my opinion, and you don't say, this is the church's opinion. You tell them, this is God's opinion, and here's where it says it in the Scripture. When I was a kid, we weren't allowed to ask questions. I asked my dad a question one time. He says, you ever bring that up again, I'm going to give you a whipping. <laughs> okay, Dad. They didn't give answers. I decided I'm going to find the answers, and I'm going to give them to my kids. And I did. And so now they're teaching the same stuff I taught them. But as you teach a child, and as they grow, you can begin releasing the restrictions on them. And here's the fact. Your job as a parent is to prepare your kids for life. And when they turn 18, they're usually around that time they head out the door. You must prepare them for life. And if a child, by the time he's 15 or 16, isn't embracing the truths that you have taught him, he's either a rebel or you haven't taught him very well, or you are teaching him legalism that doesn't hold water. You know what the key to raising kids is? Teaching them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. I taught a sermon today and two weeks ago, a two-part two series, and in it... I addressed what is evil, where did it come from, and how do we overcome it? It's one of the biggest questions the church has to answer. It's a very big question. Brothers and sisters, if you teach your kids what evil is, and you teach them what the scripture teaches, by the time they get to be teenagers, they're going to be saying, that's what I believe. And they're not going to say, that's what dad says. They're going to be saying, that's what the Bible says. My daughter came to me when she was about 20. And she says, you know, dad, something happened when I was 15. She said, I always worshiped because you told us to. Now, at our church, we don't worship quite like you do. We're a little bit more exuberant. Just asked, let me. And we, we worship loud and long for about... 35 or 40 minutes. And we, we sing, we raise our hands, we sing to the song of the Lord, and once the song is over, we just keep worshiping. And my daughter, when, when my kids were little, I said, if, if I catch you not worshiping, when we get home, you're getting a spanking. People say, you, you did that? If they didn't do their homework and didn't do their math, would you give them a spanking? Well, yeah. Well, the most important thing is worshiping God, and if they don't do that, they're going to get a spanking. So when my daughter was 15, she told me when she was around 20, she says, you know, Dad, something happened. It was really interesting. I've never told you this. She said, when I was 15, I realized I was worshiping because you made us. But I decided from now on, I'm going to worship because it's right, and it's biblical, and it's God's way. And she's one of the main worshiper, worshipers in our church. She plays the organ, the piano, Leads in worship. She doesn't lead from the platform, but she leads on the piano and the organ. Kids will finally say, you know what? Mom and dad's teaching is biblical, and I'm going to impose restrictions on my own life. And if you're still imposing restrictions on your 15-year-old, you have already lost the war. And you better get on your face and find out what to do. Are you listening to me? You know what? I, like I said, you don't put a Band-Aid when you need surgery. You don't put a little bit of ointment on a cancer. You deal with the issue. When you study the Word of God, what you will find is all through the Word of God, there's a phrase Get a concordance and look this up. You can only do this in English, but look it up. Order, O-R-D-E-R. -E Divine order. All you have to do is look at our creation, look at the universe, and our universe is incredibly ordered. The Milky Way has a billion stars, and they don't run into each other. And there are billions of 
galaxies like the Milky Way, and we're not running into them. God has created an ordered universe. But he's also, in his word, created the order of his kingdom. And I'm going to tell you something that I think is really important. I want to ask you, what is the gospel? The good news. And I suppose you're answering that. Hopefully you're answering it in your minds. How to get saved? It's not the gospel. Do you know that Jesus came preaching the gospel? John the Baptist came preaching the gospel. And they didn't, uh, the disciples were preaching the gospel, and they didn't even know Jesus was going to die. You know what they were preaching? The Bible tells us in Mark 1, 14 and 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, listen to this, of the kingdom of God. He didn't come preaching how to get saved. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He came preaching that there's a kingdom dawning on society, and I'm the king, and my kingdom has ways and order. Learn what that is and live according to it. I wish I could go on for hours, but I can't. But I am going to do one more diagram. We're dealing with, yeah. Okay, 10 or 12 minutes, I can finish up. That'll work for me. In the Bible, we are told that Moses prayed in Exodus 33, and he said, If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. Show me now thy ways, is other translations, that I may know thee. Psalm 103.7 says, God made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Hebrews 3 tells us how important knowing his ways. He says, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in the heart, and they've not known my ways, so I swore, swore in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And then he says in Hebrews 12, Wherefore, receiving a kingdom, kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and reverently with godly fear. Paul, or, or Moses prays and he says, Lord, you have said I have found grace in your sight. He says, but if I have found grace, he said, he moved off of that, and he said, show me your ways. But he didn't end there. He said, that I may know you. But he didn't end there. He said, that... I may receive grace in your sight. He started out saying, Lord, you told me I've received grace. We sang about grace today, and we love grace, don't we? We all love grace. Grace is access to God that he has provided by himself. And grace allows us to meet with him. But Moses said, you say I found grace, so based on your report, Father, I'm asking you to show me your ways. And we know from Psalm that he did learn his ways. But he said, I want to know your ways, not just so I can be smart guy and know all the ways of God, and I can really give a dissertation on theology. He said, I want to know your ways so I can get to know you. Then he says, that I may receive grace. That's where he started. Let me show you that diagram in three dimension as best as I can. Here's what it looks like. Here's grace. Here's his ways. 
And here's where we know him. But that process goes over and is repeated over and over and over and over and over and over and over for the rest of our journey as children of the Most High. If you're not learning constantly new ways of God and you're not growing in your knowledge of Him, you have atrophied in your Christian experience. You're drying up. You're lukewarm. And you're in trouble. Boy, it's quiet in here. I'm sorry, but I just say it the way the Bible says it. We are to be constantly learning more of his ways to learn more of him, to learn, get more grace, to learn more of his ways, to learn more of him, to get more of his grace. And we should be going up an ascending relationship with our God. If we're not, we have become stagnated and lukewarm. When was the last time God showed you one of his ways that you never knew before? That kind of puts it right where it's at, doesn't it? When was the last time God opened your eyes to see wondrous things from his law that you didn't know, wondrous things about his ways, and you stood there in amazement? If God isn't showing you fresh revelation of his ways, and you're not learning fresh revelation of the knowledge of God, you are literally camping around your salvation experience, and you're going nowhere. But I learned something as a child. There's a thing called the deeper life. There's a thing called the kingdom of God. There's a thing called the ways of God. And I've been on a journey now for over 50 years, learning those ways, studying that kingdom, and applying the truths to my life and as many people as I possibly can. I close with a story. Years ago, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was in this building with a bunch of other Christians, and we were told that Jesus was going to meet with us in an auditorium in that building. And we were all excited, and we were told he was going to ask us what we wanted from him. What do you want from me? And all of a sudden, I could see and discern like a prophet every single thing everybody was wanting. One guy was wanting more ability as a lawyer because he wanted to be famous. I could see the motive and I could see the desire. And as I was walking down this corridor with all these other people, I realized they're going to ask for the wrong thing. And in this dream, this was kind of unusual, I was an alcoholic. And the reason that's unusual is I've never drank in my life. I never have, just wasn't something I ever did. Being a Christian all my life, it just was not something I got into. But in the dream, I was. And so we go into this big room, and it had a bunch of round tables, and I suspect you got a bunch of round tables in there tonight. And there was a, a runway, like on a model run, like, like models walk down on runways. And we were all waiting for Jesus. But I was such an outcast that nobody would even sit with me. And Jesus walked into the room. I was shocked when I saw him because he looked different than I ever dreamed he did. He was a 33-year-old man. And one thing he was was full of joy, and you Romanians should learn some of that. <laughs> I'm serious. I've been around you quite a while. There's not a whole lot of joy showing up on your faces. And if it's in here, it's going to come out here. 
But he came into this room and he walked in, and I gotta be careful because I, I have a thing called vestibular neuritis. My right ear, the nerve in my right ear was killed by a virus in the Philippines and I have lost all balance in my right ear. So I've got to be careful. If you see me stagger, I'm not drunk. <laughs> but I do not have my balance the way I should. Jesus comes into the room, and here's how he came in. First of all, he was beaming. He was 33 years old, and here's how he walked in. Just charged into that room. And when he got to the front... Are these connected? Shucks. Can we unconnect them? Oh. Put it out there. When he got to the end of the runway, he came in. Not like I'm doing right now, but he sat down very, very dr dramatically. He put his arm over the back of the chair like this. He crossed his leg and he said, I have been looking forward to being with all of you. And I thought, what I saw in these guys' hearts, I wouldn't have been looking forward to be with any of them. Of course, they didn't want to be with me because I was a drunk. And after he made a few comments, he turns to me, and I was the first one he asked the question. He said, what do you want from me? I started to sob. This experience was very much like Solomon, where the Lord met with him and said, what do you want? And when he asked him for what he wanted, the Lord was thrilled with his answer. And I looked at the Lord, and through sobs, I was literally having a hard time getting out my answer. I said, Lord, Lord, I want, I want you to give me the wings of a dove so I can fly to wherever you are. And I want to lead as many people as I can to be there as well. And he looked at me, and he looked at the whole crowd, and he says, that's what I want all of you to desire. When Jesus saved you, he saved you so you could be with him. He called the 12 disciples in Mark chapter 3 and says he called them and ordained that they should be with him and then go preach the gospel. Jesus wants our fellowship. He wants time spent with him. He wants us to be bathed in his presence. So when we stand up and speak or talk or testify or whatever God calls us to do, people are touched. One time a lady came to my house to borrow something and she was my assistant pastor's sister and she was a power lady, powerful lady who was a corporate leader had nothing to do with God. She came into my, liver, my front door. And I said about three sentences to her. This was one hard lady. One dynamic, executive-style lady. And she started to sob. And she said... What, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I'm not like this. I never cry. What's wrong with me? I said, let me introduce you to the presence of Jesus. You aren't going to be able to introduce people to the presence of Jesus unless you've been with him. And if you're with him, you'll be able to affect lives. And people will be wanting what you have. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Mark. We're thankful for the knowledge as well as for the teaching that comes through the Holy Spirit in the passages and the words that you brought. Really, the climax and the culmination of all the effort that was done here tonight was to do what the Bible says that those who are favored of his do, and that's call out to God. Those who shout out, those who call out to the name of God, those who pray. The whole reason for the worship, the songs, the whole reason for the message, the whole reason was so that the Holy Spirit could have some time to convict every one of the hearts that are here tonight. Because the most important part of tonight, while you were invited to come to a baby dedication, that's not the most important thing tonight. The most important thing tonight was that the Holy Spirit would convict each and every one of your hearts. Speak through you, whether it be through song, whether it be through the sermon, whether it be through the verse that I'm about to read right now. That the important part of the church that's here is to pray together. I know in different churches, they sing together, but they pray individually. Some sing individually and pray together. At this church, we have corporate worship as well as corporate prayer. We don't go one by one. We don't do, we just get together like the Bible calls out as a people, as a congregation, and really call out to God with what it is that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of. I don't know what it is that you've gone through this week, this month, this year. I don't know what it might be that God is speaking to you tonight. But I think it's been enough of God speaking to you, and it's time for you to start speaking to him. Because if there is no back and forth in this dialogue, there's no conversation. The Bible claims multiple times to call on the name of the Lord, to confess your sins, to come to him. And here we're going to read a verse out of Second Chronicles, which is very popular, which is what, one of the reasons why we want to cry out together. Trust me, no one's listening to your prayer. I have enough problems, and everyone around you has enough problems to deal with their own prayer. Whether you want to kneel, whether you want to stand, whether you want to be on, uh, with your face on the floor, hands lifted up, or just praying in your mind. The Bible says, if my people... And I want to include myself, my daughter who is here for the baby dedication, but more importantly than that, you who are here in the house of God. If you, who are called by the name of the mighty God, will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and his approval, not my approval and not the approval of man, and here, turn from their wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will hear their land. That is the promise that is waiting for every single person who walked into this church this evening. The promise of being forgiven, the promise of the healing, the promise of the presence of God individually in your lives is the promise that is available to you tonight. And I'm hoping that by the worship mending your heart and by the word piercing your heart, there is something that you really truly want to say to God. Because whether it was in the dream for Pastor Mark, Jesus is here tonight asking, what do you want from me? And I want you to take that step in faith and really believe that he's here. The Bible says two or three gathered in her name, and there's plenty more than two or three. And we felt his presence in worship as well as in prayer, as well as in the word. I am convinced that he's here and he's asking you, dear loved one, dear invited friend and family, Jesus is asking you point blank, what do you want from him? And the most amazing thing is that the grace we have tonight is that you can speak to him and tell him. Don't be afraid to open your mouth. Don't be afraid to to pray. Don't be afraid to cry out to God. There's no better place to do this than in the house of prayer. When you come to church, when you come to this church, understand that the reason Jesus was flipping tables was because it was no longer a house of prayer. If you go to church and you don't pray, get out of that church. Prayer is the most important thing. Prayer is the reason for the reason we sing. Prayer is for the reason that the word was brought forth so that you have something to pray and communicate to God. 
So you can tell him that you do need his forgiveness and you need his healing. And he loves you so much that he is willing to give it to each and every one of us if we do what it says here to do. Us as a people, us as a congregation, come forward and pray to the mighty God who created me and you. He's desiring this. He's not some old man on a throne far away. He's right here in the midst of his people who call his name. There's some of you that have been hurting for years. There's some of you that have been dealing with, with sickness for years. There's some of you who just don't understand the path that God is putting forth in front of you, whether it be for faith or whatever it may be. But the whole reason tonight was so that you could come tonight and speak to Christ. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to pay money for any candles. You don't have to go through confession of a man. There is a clear path between us and God the creator through Jesus. He is our high priest. Pray to him. He will intercede to God the Father for all of us. Some of you have been in Romanian churches. Some of you haven't. This isn't a Romanian church thing. This is a listening to God's commandment thing, to get together and cry out to him. For some of you, it might be strange. Don't worry about it. Close your eyes and think on him. Think about his sacrifice. Think about what he has done for you and think about the question he's asking you. What do you want from Jesus? Let's stand, please. I don't know if it's going to be two minutes. I don't know if it's going to be five minutes. What's important is that you treat this time important as you would communicate with your children, with your spouse, with anyone that you truly are in love with. To really be able to speak to God face to face. Many people go through their entire life, through their entire week, not noticing the creation that God has done all around us to get our attention, to snap our heads away from our phones and away from our screens and really look at, wow, how much God has done in this earth and for our lives. But here at church, we want to snap your head, your head away from the screen away from the drama, away from whatever it is that is causing your life to keep you from focusing on God. Take one, take two, take three minutes, take four minutes, take as much time as you need. But take this time seriously and come forth like the Bible says. If my people, me and you who are called by his name will humble ourselves. We're not embarrassing ourselves to come out and to pray together. We're doing it because we're honoring the God that we love. If we are to humble ourselves, if we are to be able to turn from our wicked ways, he will forgive us and he will heal us. Is that something that we want? Is that something we want for our children, something we want for ourselves? It's shown through our prayer life. And I pray to God that we learn and we grow and we grow more and more week after week in our communication with God. Amen? Amen. Let's come together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you've done.